Hey guys, so since I'm focusing on Salado Polychrome for part of this season, I wanna start off with a good video explaining how Salado Polychrome is made. So my goal for this video is the nuts and bolts of Salado Polychrome. What it is, the materials that go into it, how those materials are put together and made. I'm gonna try not to go into the history of Salado Polychrome very much, and that's hard for me because I'm a lover of history. The backstory is really important to me, but I'm gonna try to focus on the nuts and bolts and not the history. If you'd like to learn more about the history of Salado Polychrome, I made a real good video last year. I'll put the link to that video right over here. You can check that out if you wanna see that, okay? Now let's talk about what Salado Polychrome is. At its heart, Salado Polychrome is just brownware pottery. Archaeologists lump it into a category they call Roosevelt Redware, but it's only slipped red. Inside, it's truly brownware. So if you look at Salado shirts as a cross section, or if you look inside of a jar, places where it's not slipped, 99.9% .9 of the time formed out of brown clay. Now there's, you know, there's instances where uh, the base clay is, leans more towards red but that's just because it was made in a hundred different locations. Each one of those locations where it was made was using clay that was local to that village. And so in some cases, uh, that clay tended to be more red, but it evolved out of the Mogollon brownware tradition. And at its heart, it is still a Mogollon brownware pottery, low fired, gritty Mogollon brownware pottery. That brown clay has a lot to do with what Salado Polychrome is and the beautiful colors that were achieved. And that is because it's brown because it's full of minerals, uh, minerals that have leached into the clay, minerals that were in the stones that it eroded from. It's full of minerals that give it that brown or reddish brown color. And those minerals, or some of those minerals, act as natural fluxes in the clay. And those natural fluxes make that clay mature at a low temperature. So part of what makes a lot of polychrome beautiful is that it's fired at very low temperatures. And those low temperatures are achievable because of the brownware clay that it's made out of. Now we come to the white clay slip. When we look at Salado polychrome pottery, it looks like the black designs have a white outline around them. But the truth is the black paint is painted on top of a white slipped area. So every place you see black and white designs, that entire area is covered with white slip and then the black is painted on top of it. A lot of times the red and the white don't meet up. So you, you can see the little brown margin in between the red and the white, which shows you that they were painting the white in just where they wanted it and then the red as well. So the white slip is critical and the white slip is a rare thing. In most of the area where Salada Polychrome was made here in the Southern Southwest, white clay is extremely rare and extremely hard to come by. And most of those white or whitish clays that you will find in this area will not stay white in an oxidizing fire. We know it was oxidizing because of the red. Most of those light colored clays will turn tan or cream or buff or even a little bit yellowy colored in an oxidizing fire. On top of that fact that white clay is very rare in this area, this clay is special in that it holds organic paint and allows it to turn into black designs in the right kind of firing. Most clays, indeed most white clays, will burn out and leave you with no design on top of that or a light gray design after the firing. So that type of clay that holds onto that carbon and allows it to form black designs on the pot is also unique. As I said, I've looked everywhere for this clay and I don't believe it exists in the Southern Southwest. After something like 30 years of searching, I decided that this white clay had to have been imported from Northern Arizona. If you travel north of the Mogollon Rim, up to places where clays such as the Chinle Formation are, you will find an abundance of white clay or light colored clay that will hold this organic paint and allow it to turn black. It is my belief, it is my contention that the white clay used on Salado Polychrome was all imported, provided on trade routes or brought back by pilgrims from someplace north of the Mogollon Rim. Now let's talk about the red material. It's always stone polished, as I said, and it's always a nice bright red. Patricia Crown has noted that the red is very similar across a large area where this was made, that the colors are all very close. 
and therefore it's been speculated that this red material was all coming from one or two locations. Now I've already pointed out that the white was being imported for use as a slip on this pottery. And I would say that it's likely that the red also was provided by those trade routes or by pilgrims, that it was brought from far away. One thing that my archeologist friends have told me is that this red is not clay. They can look at this under a microscope and tell that it's not clay. It's some kind of red ochre or red hematite. I've gotten my best reds, those that are most similar to the prehistoric Salado pottery from red ochres. Ochreous, soft, earthy hematite that is then mixed into a solution and painted on and then polished in. Now let's talk about the paint. Some prehistoric Salado polychrome really was made with mineral paint, but most of it, something like 90% or more of Salado polychrome is painted with organic paint. Now as to what the organic paint is made from, we have no idea. A lot of people like to use Rocky Mountain Bee Plant because those Pueblo potters that make organic painted pottery today, such as San Domingo Pueblo, they use Rocky Mountain Bee Plant. And that is possible that that's what they were using. But Rocky Mountain Bee Plant does not grow in most of the range where Salata Polychrome was manufactured prehistorically along the Salt and Gila rivers. Could they have been importing Rocky Mountain Bee Plant or even growing it in their gardens? Absolutely. I have tried making black paint, organic paint out of a number of different plants. Mesquite bean, yucca fruit, bee plant, tansy mustard. This particular test cylinder has a variety of different paints and paint thicknesses that were applied. And they all turned reasonably black. This test cylinder here has even more exotic materials. I tried Kung Pao sauce and Mrs. Butterworth syrup, among other things. And again, achieved a reasonable black on all of them. So they could have been using something that was indigenous to the Southern Southwest, like mesquite beans. Those would have been easily collected and boiled down. Or they may have been importing Rocky Mountain bee plant. Since this technology for organic painted pottery came originally from the North, the recipe may have stipulated certain ingredients, ones that maybe didn't grow here. And so that was imported. We've already said that the red and the white materials that are painted on the outside may very well have been imported from the North. It's not that big of a stretch then to say that the organic paint was imported from the North as well. Now let's talk about firing. The last test of the pot. Once you've made it, you have to fire it before it can become pottery. I have not only spent a lot of time looking for that special white slip, but I've spent a lot of time experimenting with different firings. If you over oxidize it, the paint burns out and you get something like this. The paint starts coming off and you get this kind of spotty result. If you under oxidize it, if it doesn't oxidize long enough, then you get this kind of dirty finish, this kind of grungy gray finish and your whites aren't white and your blacks don't look all that black either. In your firing, there's a narrow window when you want to stop the firing. A short, brief, low temperature firing. There's a window there between about 680 and 750. When the technology for making Salata Polychrome came south from the Mogollon Rim in about 1300, it probably came with very specific instructions on how to fire it. This kind of information we don't have today we have never even located an actual Salado pottery firing location. So we can only guess or do experiments and try to see what imitates or what makes a pot that looks like the prehistoric record. Okay, so now hopefully we have an understanding of the structure of a Salado polychrome pot, what the parts are. Now let's talk about how we can recreate that today. So first of all, we wanna find a body clay that is brownware. All clays are different, so let me stress that right away. But I think a brownware clay is gonna naturally include those minerals that are gonna act as fluxes and allow it to mature at a lower temperature, say around 700 degrees Celsius. I would recommend a, a wild brown clay, or if you don't have access to that, try a commercial brownware clay. Fire it up to 700 degrees Celsius and then see if it's turned into ceramic. Is it ceramic or is it still clay? You can check to see if your pottery has matured into ceramics by just putting water in it and letting it soak for a few hours. See if it falls apart or if it's still hard. Now let's talk about that white slip. Commercial white 
where clay will probably not be sufficient because it needs to be that special smectite clay that's gonna hold onto that organic paint. You can try ordering some commercial bentonite or montmorillonite. I tried some Wyoming bentonite that I ordered off Amazon a few years ago and it had a very strange texture. It was hard to apply to the pot, but it did turn organic paint black. This white clay that I've been using works really well. I dug an abundance of this up in Northern Arizona this summer and I'm selling baggies of it on my website. I'm not trying to sell to you. I'm not trying to make a bunch of money. I am trying to support my channel and I am trying to make this available to people because I get a lot of requests for the material that holds organic paint so they can try making organic painted pottery. So this is available on my website. So you can give that a try. Um, the way I process this, uh, this stuff is relatively pure, so I don't have to levigate it. I merely just strain out the lumps. Some of this clay has a lot of grit and other things in it that need to be taken out. And so levigation is your best way of processing that. That is mixing it up in water, letting it settle, let those larger particles settle to the bottom and then pour off that smooth suspended material on the top. Um, but this is really pure and I don't need to do that. All I'm doing to process this material is soaking it in water for an hour or two, mixing it up with a spoon or a brush, just something to kind of mix it up fairly thin. And then I just pour it through a paint strainer to remove the lumps. That's all you have to do. Okay, uh, now let's talk about the red material. Like I said, it's not clay according to archeologists. This is some of that red ochre that I collected up in the Sierra Ancha Mountains last fall. If you haven't seen that video, I'll put the link to it right over here. Uh, I made a video, I went up there, there's some ruins and there's red ochre all over the place. And this is processed, that is, I levigated it to remove all the rock-like chunks and I have just the finest, finest powdery material. And the way I'm using this is I mix it up in a solution Here's some that I have already. I keep it fairly watery and I just paint it on the pot with a brush. As I said before, just in the areas that I want red. And I do this while the pot is leather hard. It hasn't fully dried. Then I go over it with a stone before it's dry and that presses those iron particles into the clay so they become permanent. Any of the red that you put on the pot but don't polish will come off on your hands after firing. So you have to make sure you polish all of that. Every place you want the red is polished and that sets it into the clay. Now, if you don't have access to red ochre, and I know a lot of you don't, you can buy red iron oxide online. You can buy it through Amazon. I'll put a link in the doobly-doo where you can buy it on Amazon. And you can apply it the same way. Mix it up in a thin solution with water, paint it on the pot. And when it's the right level of dryness, go over it with a stone. You should be able to use any red iron oxide that you can purchase at a ceramic store or online. Now let's talk about the organic paint. This is a little bowl of Rocky Mountain bee plant that my friend Tori Hoops gave to me. And that's a nice way to store it in a little bowl. You can just add water when you're ready to use it and mix it up, paint right off the top. And then when you're done, it just dries out. You don't wanna keep it in a sealed jar because if you do, it can grow mold and get nasty. If you don't have access to Rocky Mountain Bee Plant, I'm sorry, I do not sell that on my website. Uh, you can use a lot of different things. Uh, one thing that works really well, that's abundant in a lot of places, and that's sunflowers. I suppose you could use regular domesticated garden variety sunflowers, uh, but I've used roadside wild sunflowers, just the whole plant chopped up, thrown in a pot and boiled down. You boil it down until it's a thick tea, Take the solids out, run the material through some cheesecloth or a strainer or something to remove all the solid bits and then boil that down to a goo and save it. But if you don't wanna go through all that effort, you can use a lot of things. Like I said, you can use pancake syrup. You can use Kung Pao sauce. Um, I'm sure Karo or anything like that that's kind of sticky can be painted on. Now you're gonna wanna maybe add some water or adjust the thickness of it, but uh, that should work, so you can always try that. I had actually pretty decent results from Mrs. Butterworth. So that lead brings us to how to fire it. Um, and uh, this is where I'm gonna be the least useful because I have made a lot of Salado Polychrome replicas, but I've only ever fired them outdoors. And, and you can watch my videos and you can watch this example right here and get an idea of how I fire it outdoors and do that. 
But I know that not everybody watching my videos has access to places where they can go out and build fires. If that's your problem, then uh, you may be able to try firing this in a kiln. In fact, I would like to hear from you if you're able to fire this in a kiln. If you do that, just be sure you keep the temperature really low. So we're looking at like 700 Celsius as the high temperature and a fairly short duration. So if you can set your kiln to fire short and low temp, you may do really well. You just don't want to over oxidize. So once you hit seven, you want to start coming back down. I would be glad to hear what you achieve if you try that. There's the Urban Anazazi firing that I talked about in a previous video. I'll put the link over here. The way Tony Soares does it. And that's another way you might try. I just don't know if you'll over oxidize it doing that. So if you try it again, leave a comment. Let us know how that works out. So here's a little pot I made recently, uh, and this is unpainted yet. So I applied the white thin. It, you can almost see through it in places. It's quite thin. And then the red was applied again in a separate area to where the white is. They don't really overlap. And you can see the red is polished. It has a little bit of a shine to it where the white is quite matte. It does not shine. It's not glossy. And that's because it was not stone polished. And the red is. And then once it's bone dry, I will apply my organic paint and put my designs on. And then when I fire it, those designs will turn black. Hopefully that gives you an idea about how you can go about making Salado polychrome replicas at home. Now let's talk about those five pots I chose to replicate this year. First of all, that little Gila bowl is eight and a half inches in diameter, and it's about five inches high. The Tonto jar, that's about eight inches in diameter. It's about six inches high. And the mouth, the opening of the jar is about four and three quarter inches, it's just shy of five inches. The Gila football pot, it's about nine and a half inches long and about six inches high. Now, the way it was in the case, I wasn't able to pull the pots out of the case, obviously. So I was literally holding my tape measure up against the glass to try to get these measurements and eyeballing it. And the way the football pot was set in the case, I really couldn't get a width. You know, I could get the length of the football, but not the width. We'll just have to do our best on that. Uh, now the Tonto duck is about eight inches in diameter and six inches tall and the mouth of that duck is about four inches. And the last one, uh, that Dinwiddie bowl. Now, I'll talk to you about that. This one's gonna be especially challenging. That Dinwiddie bowl is 12 inches in diameter, so it's a good size pot. And believe me, that was the smallest Dinwiddie bowl I saw there. I was looking for a Dinwiddie bowl, um, but I wanted the smallest one I could get because I wanted it something that was attainable to people. So 12 inches was the smallest one they had in the collection. Uh, so 12 inch in diameter and six and a half inches tall. Uh, so here's the thing, uh, Dinwiddie is painted with those Salado black, white, and red designs on the outside of the bowl, but the inside is purely black. Now the inside black was not achieved using organic paint. It was literally fired in such a way that there was a lot of carbon and very little oxygen available to the inside of the pot. I've achieved smudged pottery before in a couple of different ways. Sometimes you can just set it on the ground upside down and fire it with a little bit of wood under the pot and you'll get a black. But some people have complained that the rims of their pots don't get fired well that way, that they fire the pot separately and then they put it on the ground and smudge it. So I think that's what I'm going to try in this case. I'm gonna make the pot, I'm gonna fire it upside down, but I'm gonna leave it elevated like I always do my firings on stones so that oxygen can get in there. That way we get a lot of heat circulating, we get a good firing. Then I'm gonna pull that pot out. I'm gonna stick it on the ground over the top of some pine needles or grass or something that will combust and smudge the inside while it's still very hot. That's what I'm gonna try. So that's why I say this one is especially challenging. Uh, not only is it the largest pot in these five, but that smudging while getting a good clean design on the outside, which you can see this design is not clean. The, uh, the whites are quite gray. I'm gonna hope to do better than that. So go ahead and, and try making those, any one of those. I would love to see how you're able to do. Whether you're using the slip that I have available on my website or something else, I would be very interested, especially if you're doing it authentically using organic paint 
and firing in a kiln, all of that would be very fascinating to see how you do. When you make a pot, upload it to Instagram using the hashtag Salado Challenge, and then I will get those pictures and share them here on my YouTube channel. And we will all get a chance to look at how everybody's doing on making these Salado Polychrome replicas. I got some bonus pots as well. So if none of these five really do it for you, if they weren't really uh, challenging enough or are too challenging, I got some extra ones that when I was up at the Mills collection, I looked at some extra pots and took measurements. So there's a few more you could do related to this that are not ones that I'm doing. Here you go. Uh, I'm gonna start out with the hardest one, the big Tonto jar. So if you feel that none of these five are challenging enough, here is a big Tonto jar you can do. This sucker is 14 inches in diameter and 10 inches tall. Uh, now I have another football pot. The one I'm doing is a Gila Polychrome football. This one is a little more football shaped, a little pointier on the ends. And it is a Tonto Polychrome football. It is eight and a half inches long and five and a half inches tall. Uh, there's a vase, a Gila Polychrome vase. That is uh, seven inches in diameter and eight inches tall. And the opening is about three and a quarter inches. There's this little Gila jar and it's six inches in diameter and it's five inches tall. The opening is about three and a half inches. I'm gonna call this one Gila white top. And the reason is most Salado polychrome jars have the inside of the rim painted red. But on this one, the white goes over the top and down inside another inch or so. So this Gila white top jar is six and a half inches in diameter and five inches tall. Okay, one more. I've got these two small Gila bowls. Uh, these are about six inches wide and I don't have the height on them, but those are nice, small, like fit in the palm of your hand bowls. That would be fairly easy to make. I'm looking forward to see what you guys come up with. I'm anxious to see some of you try to do Salado Polychrome replicas. I've laid out how Salado Polychrome is put together, how the ancients did it, and then I've talked about how I do it or how you could do it today. Hopefully this has been helpful. If you want to know more about firing Salado Polychrome, a really good example of how I fire Salado Polychrome pottery, I'm gonna be doing a demonstration firing in Oro Valley, Arizona on December 11th. So I'll be at Steam Pump Ranch in Oro Valley on the morning, I don't know, it starts at 8, 8.30, it's fairly early. In the morning of December 11th, when I'm there, I will do two firings. I will do one Salado Polychrome firing, and then after that I'll do a regular firing, which is a little different, a regular oxidation firing. So I'll do two firings. If you get there early enough, you'll be able to watch the Salado Polychrome pottery firing, if you're interested in that and that's in Oro Valley, Arizona, at Steam Pump Ranch, and that's in conjunction with Archaeology Southwest. They're the ones that have invited me out. The other thing I wanted to tell you was my Ancient Potters Club, which is my online Zoom class. We get together every Wednesday night and make pottery together over Zoom. And our project in November is a Salado Polychrome jar. So if you're really interested in this and you wanna try your hand at it, and you want a little more help, uh, if you join the Ancient Potters Club in November, uh, you will get to see uh, the making of a Salado Polychrome jar and, and work together with a group in doing that. If you're interested in learning more about Salado Polychrome pottery, check out this video right over here, which goes into the history and the background of Salado Polychrome. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you next time.